from a field that prides itself in being scientifically oriented. As such, we gather data about the work that we're doing, and we then go to implement that in, a, in an applied manner. We call it applied behavior analysis. <coughs> and in doing so, we learn more about what we're doing. And so that it, it results in us being able to ask more questions, investigate a little bit further. So we continually are learning about this subject matter, how we can best work with children to teach them skills that they need to learn. The key issue here is for you to have some practical information to go home with, okay? I want that to be our goal. So that's where my emphasis is going to be. I'm going to show you lots of videos during the day and I'm going to be explaining to you about the concepts. I'm not just going to be lecturing to you and then not giving you some of the details. I'm going to walk you through some of the videos of how we actually implement this with children because that's what's so important that you actually see the implementation. Okay, we come from science, we've learned about children, we gather data, we go to implement, we find out what's working, what's not working, what's working better, and then we revise things. So things that I'm saying today, some of the concepts I'm going to be presenting, some of the statements I'm going to be making are going to be different than it was five years ago when I was talking about things. We've learned a lot and we will continue to do so. So just because I say it today doesn't mean that in five years from now it's not going to be different. Most of the concepts will be the same. Most of the issues will be the same. But how we might approach it could be considerably different depending upon what we learn about effective methods for working with children. So I always start there. Anyhow, the topic is teaching language to children with autism or other developmental disabilities. There's been an explosion in the area of autism diagnosis and that's very important that we then address these issues because there's so many families out there that are dependent upon us to figure that out. This is a subject which is very near and dear to my heart. As I said, I've been doing this since the 70s, working with children with a special emphasis on teaching language to children. I am not a speech and language pathologist. I want to make that very clear. I'm a behavior analyst. But some of the behaviors that we work on are language behaviors. And as you see as we get into this, language is very, very important. When we start looking at the field of autism, we have to start with the definition. What is autism? Well, I like to say that the word autism is just a word. Okay, that's all. These are kids that we're talking about. These kids have some differences from some other children in some very unique ways. However, this whole thing about autism, say, well, I've got a child with autism. You know what that's like? And say, well, no, I don't, because I don't know your child. I have to know what your child is doing or not doing, what they can do, what they won't do, and so forth. Because I like to say that this autism spectrum disorder really defines a heterogeneous group of individuals. They're not the same. They're all different. It's just like saying someone's Caucasian. You don't know what you're going to get until you meet the person and start interacting with them. But there are some similarities that resulted in getting this word autism associated with them. One is that there's qualitative impairments in the area of language. They have some language delays, some communication delays that are fairly significant. However, they can be entirely different from one child to the next. It can be from one child who doesn't communicate at all to another one who's having some difficulty with pronouns and prepositions and, and getting those issues right, okay, word order correct. This is the primary issue, though, as far as I'm concerned. When you start looking at a child with an autism diagnosis, language plays a major role in all the other issues that you're dealing with. So, for instance, we say they have a qualitative impairment in language. However, they also have social interaction delays. Okay, so this is an interesting part because if you don't have language skills, you can't communicate, you can't talk about things that are important to you, things you've done, what you did the night before, or what you're hoping to do next week or when you go someplace, then how are you going to have much in the way of social interaction? You're not. You may have some physical interaction, but so much of our social interaction is dependent upon our communication skills. So we have to hit the communication skills, the language skills, head on if we're going to hope to deal with some of these social interaction issues. Now there's other issues with the social interaction. We'll be talking about that during the day too. Some motivational issues about why should they interact with us and so forth. However, I don't want to suggest necessarily that this is a causal relationship, but if you don't have very good language skills and you don't then have the ability to socially interact and entertain yourself through interacting with others like we typically would do, then what are you going to do? Well, you're not going to sit around and do nothing. You're going to do something. And this is where it gets interesting because 
The third category is this restricted range of interests or activities. It's also referred to as the autism behaviors, the repetitive types of behaviors, the obsessive compulsive type tendencies, and so on. But when you stop to look at it, restricted range of interests, what are you going to do if you're not going to be socially interacting with somebody? You're going to be doing something else. You're going to entertain yourself in some way. One of the things that often happens is I'll find kids will find very unusual things to start entertaining themselves. So for instance, they might like a pattern that they can make by tapping things. And now that may not be very exciting to us, but for a child who can't interact and do other things with somebody else, they may find that entertaining. They might also find some light source, like here, I like to play with the light. And I start moving my finger back and forth in front of this light, and I get a strobe effect on there. I get to see the dust particles jump. And I don't need you to get that. I don't need to socially interact with you. So when you stop to look at children with a diagnosis of autism, you say, well, why are they engaging in these inappropriate types of behaviors or these unusual types of behaviors? Well, there can be many reasons. But again, one could also take a look at the factors that I don't have appropriate ways of interacting and doing other ways of entertaining myself. And so this is where we start looking at this restricted range of interest, this autism behaviors as being perhaps partly contributed by the fact that they're missing some skills. So hitting the language skills, what we're going to be talking about today, is very, very critical in their life for social interaction and perhaps getting them interested in other types of activities in their community and family. Now, this is another interesting thing. Autism, start talking about it, and you start hearing words like cure, recovery, making indistinguishable, and I don't use those terms, and there's a reason why I don't. I've helped a lot of children a number of children have gone on to regular education and have done well as regular education type students. There's a whole lot of children we've worked with that have not. They're still requiring special education type services. And as I'm going to show you with some of the research that's out there, we know that more than half the kids under the best of circumstances with the best training that we know available are still going to require some special education type of services as they go through school. So that being the case, I don't like to just say we're going to try to make this all go away. Of course we're going to try to make this all go away if we can. Every parent would like that to happen because nobody wants to have a child with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder if they, can, if they don't have to. Nobody signed up for this. Okay? But now that they're in this situation, of course if we could make this all go away, we would all want it to go away, wouldn't we? We want these kids to be having a typical type of a life. And so that's where we're striving for. However, knowing that most of the kids, more than half, are still going to require special education services. I don't want to make that be the end all. What I'd like to say is that we want for these children the same thing as we want for every other child. We're here on this earth for a very short period of time. What we'd like for them to do is have a happy life, to enjoy life to the fullest extent possible. And so with that, that requires that they acquire as many skills as possible. Every one of us who acquires more and more skills has more and more opportunities available to us in our life. And so that's the way I approach working with children with autism. I want them to enjoy life now while they're learning. I also want them to enjoy life in the future with the skills that they have so that they're able to fully participate with their community, family, and so forth. So that's my goal. Okay? Improve the child's skills. Let's see where they're going to end up. We know that not all of them is not all going to go away, but can we make them be able to learn from their everyday interactions with others? Can they learn from other people? So that's my goal. My goal is that our teaching should result in the acquisition of generalized skills that allow the child to learn from their everyday interactions with others. When your brothers and sisters come over to their family, or the kids, aunts and uncles, the neighbors interact with the child, they may not have been taught all the different words exactly how they're supposed to interact with the child. We want the child to be able to interact with all these other individuals without these other individuals having to have specialized type of training. Now, of course, if they also have some training and they know how to encourage skill development, that's also helpful. But we don't want them to be afraid to interact with the child just because they haven't learned all the right words that they have to say to get the child to respond. We want the child to be able to learn from interacting with others including those who have not been specifically trained to teach them, okay? That's the goal. Now, as I was saying, there's some interesting research out there. One of the research articles that I want people to be aware of, I've now realized that many people have 
not heard about this article, but back in 1987, Dr. Ivar Lovas from the UCLA program put out an article which kind of changed the way people looked at autism. Previously, before his, his article came out, it was thought that you know, autism is a lifelong type of an event and it's going to result in you know, perhaps institutionalization for a lot of the children. In fact, that was some of the trend. If you go back and you listen to some of the parents, they were told not that long ago that they may as well assume that their child was going to be institutionalized and there was, really wasn't much hope. But in 1987, Dr. Lovas published an article of some of his work. What he did was he provided intensive behavioral intervention, early intensive behavioral intervention, behavioral teaching methodology, if you will, 40 hours a week to students. And what he found was <coughs> that 47% of his student population, 19 of them, actually got into regular education without requiring assistance. Okay, so that's 47%. Again, what about the other 53%? Well, they benefited from the education, but yet they still required more special education service. But this was really a breakthrough article because what it did was it gave a lot of hope for people that in fact, if we do the right things early on for children, some of these children are going to go on and go through regular education as a regular education student. And that's an important element as a regular education student. So anyhow, that was the first one, 1987, Behavioral Treatment and Normal Educational and Intellectual Functioning in Young Autistic Children, the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, 1987, a very, very important article because that showed people we can make a difference if we really work at it very consistently and very intensely. Okay. Now I'm going to go on to some other research here. Some of my colleagues, John Jacobson, Jim Ulick, and Gina Green, published an article in Behavioral Interventions, and that was 1998. And what they did was they took the results of the Ivar Lova study, and they superimposed that on the cost of services for individuals with developmental delays in terms of what would it cost educationally, what would it cost after the children are done with educational services. They're now adults, and they now are going to be in adult community type programs for the disabled living in group homes perhaps, what's it going to cost? Well, it turns out that the cost is substantial for an individual who does not have many skills. If you've got a child who turns into an adult, who's got disruptive behavior, who needs to have very specialized type of living arrangements, it could run into the millions per individual. And that's where it gets to the point where we have to take a look at many times people in our society, whether they be educators or legislators, are saying, well, this Early intensive behavioral intervention may work, but it's very, very expensive and we can't afford it. I want to share with you the concept that we can't afford not to do it. Because if we don't do it, what are we going to end up paying for? We're going to end up paying for a lot of services for these individuals as, as they go through their life. And that's just the economic component of it. But when you consider the social element, what the impact is on the families, the extended families, the community, we want these children to do as best they can. We want them to learn as many skills as possible. It makes life better for all of us, okay? And so that's why I say, even though it may be expensive to provide these services, it's more expensive not to provide the services. So we have to kind of do a shift, and I give this to you because this is the kind of information to share with your school boards, with your legislators, so forth, so that they actually fund the programs that are necessary for these children, okay? Some more research. I'm not going to bore you with too much research, but I want you to have some critical ones, okay? 2005, one of my colleagues, Jane Howard, and her colleagues published another article. And what they did was they compared early intensive behavioral intervention or intensive ABA type treatment, applied behavior analysis, against the type of services which are typically found in a special education classroom, an eclectic type of model, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You have to realize that what happens with a lot of educational systems are you're a director of special education and what happens? You've got one family that comes up and says, well, we want this kind of therapy. Another one comes and says, we want this kind of therapy. And all oh, we heard about this and so we want this for our child. And so everybody's asking for all different types of services. 
what a lot of the special educators will tell you is it's best for them to go ahead and have all their staff trained in all these different methods because that way there when somebody comes and says well can you do this and they say well yes we can do that too the problem is when you start taking a look at an eclectic model where you're trying to do too many different types of approaches versus a straight ABA teaching type of a program it turns out that Dr. Howard has demonstrated that you get significantly better results by just doing the standard ABA type of treatment, applied behavior analysis type of educational treatment, than you do when you do an eclectic model. You get better gains in terms of skill development and cognitive development too. Okay? So this is another article. Again, people often say, I don't want to leave any stones unturned, but while you're busy turning over stones, you may be missing the opportunity to teach some of the skills that are really critical and implement what you know already works. So time is a, is a valuable resource, and we want to make sure we use it wisely. That's why I say, let's use what works. Okay? Another article that I want to point out to you was a LOVAS replication study. It was run by Glenn Sallows and his colleague Gropner part of the WEEP program, the Wisconsin Early Autism Project, and what was interesting was they set out to replicate the work of Dr. Ivar Lovas. And when they published their study, they had very, very similar results. Forty-eight percent of their population also resulted in the children getting into regular education. Okay? So we got almost identical results in terms of the outcome of this early intensive behavioral intervention. They had a couple of different strategies they were using, whether the parents were uh, in charge of the program or whether it was a consultant in charge of the program. But again, very, very similar results even between those two groups. But one of the things that I think is probably the most important outcome of this study was that they did a really nice job of identifying the skills of the children prior to them entering the treatment program. And so what they were able to do is then look back and they say, well, what about these kids coming in? that made these children do better than these other kids. They were actually able to take a look and they had fast responders and not so fast responders in terms of the treatment. And what they found was that there was some things that the children brought to the table basically when they started working and that was the kids who could imitate, the kids who could respond to some of our language as a listener, we call it receptive language skills, and also those kids who tended to have some social interaction those were some of the predictors of the children who were likely to do well once you began treatment. Because that first year response to treatment would turn out to be a critical variable. But those kids kind of took off in the first year, did, tended to do better, okay? But anyhow, those were some of the indicators. And I want to share with you from personal experience, my son and I have been doing some research on imitation and training of imitation. And it turns out that when you look at the amount of training that goes on for kids early on, kids with diagnosis of autism, a lot of times that role of the imitative repertoire is not very well <coughs> developed. They, they will perhaps work on a couple of do this and do this and do this. But when it comes down to it, when you watch the level of imitative skills of a three-year-old child, they're quite extensive. They can pay attention to the subtlest of details, okay? And it turns out that if we don't teach that, how are we going to expect these children to then be able to learn from their peers when they're interacting with them? So we've got to get them around the typically developing peers because they provide great models. But if they can't pay attention to and actually imitate those models, then they're not going to be learning a lot of the things that they're going to have available from these other kids as models. So anyhow, this was a big study, it replicated, the LOVAS, but it also gave us some more insights into what might be some of the critical skills to work on very early with these children. And as I say, I think the imitative repertoire is one of those areas that's often under-taught. So I just share that with you right away. If you're working with young kids, get them imitating, get them imitating extensively quickly, okay? Because if they're not imitating when they start treatment, that might be one of our first goals <coughs> we really look at. One of the issues that I want to take a look at with you is the contributions from this applied behavior analysis, the field of behavior analysis. There is a lot of information that we can obtain from this area of study. One has to do with how to teach. And as I mentioned to you earlier, back in the 70s there was extensive amount of research about how you teach discriminations, how you teach new skills through shaping new behaviors and prompting and fading those prompts. 
And those are the skills that every one of us should, should be having when we're working with kids with autism. If we don't have those skills, if the people who are interacting with the children don't have those skills, they're not going to be very effective in their educating of the children. So it goes back to the 70s. There's, there's hundreds if not thousands of articles about different types of teaching methodology that are very, very useful. And I'm going to be showing you some of those techniques through some of the videos today. But how to teach is critical. And everyone who works with the children, parents, speech and language pathologists, teachers, instructional assistants, all need to know these skills if they're going to be effective in helping these children. So how to teach. Another area that's kind of come about in the last 10 to 15 years that behavior analysts have really been doing much more research into is that of the motivational variables. How do we get these children to participate? How do we get them to go along with us? How do we get them to not only do the structured teaching activities that we're doing, but also use their skills in the natural environment spontaneously? And so we need to take a look at why should they? And this is an area where, again, as I said, in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of breakthroughs in terms of how do you set up conditions to get these kids to want to work for us, okay? And I'll tell you, it's not just because we're bigger than they are or smarter than they are, okay? It's because we've got to figure out how to motivate them, how do we find out what are actual reinforcers for them, such that they benefit from engaging in the activities that we're trying to set up for them to learn new, new skills. And last but not least, is what to teach. And I think this is where it gets very, very critical. One of the things that I found over and over and over again is that a lot of times people say, well, I want to teach the child. We're going to do a lot of active teaching with the ch children. We're going to get intensive time working with them. But if you don't know what it is that the child needs to learn at any one particular time, you can be making some big mistakes that are wasting your time and the child's time, and perhaps even frustrating the child. So what to teach and when to teach it is a very, very critical aspect of working with children with autism. But language has to be hit head on, as I said. We have to work right from the start with language skills. This is a primary deficit for these children. And when we're looking at teaching language to children, we have a problem. Part of that is how our society looks at language. Now, all of us will talk about receptive and expressive language as if we're, in other words, passing out ideas or, uh, or understanding different concepts that we're relaying between two individuals. And that's where we kind of get into problems. Because for us, if we say, well, you know, I really like hockey, but I'm not so much into other type of sports, you'd say you understand, if you will, that there's only certain amounts of sporting activities that might be enjoyable for me. Okay, so we, we can talk like that, and that works just fine for us. However, when you start looking at children with autism who are having difficulty talking about things, that's when we really run into problems if we're just using the standard receptive expressive uh, distinction which is often used in our society. What it does is this, this analysis actually blends some very, very useful distinctions between the different types of expressive responses. And this is where we run into problems, because expressive language is really not just expressive language. It's many different types of behaviors, and we need to take a look at them as individual behaviors, and we need to work on them and teach them to children under all these different types of conditions. Verbal behavior, the term, came from B.F. Skinner in a book that he wrote in 1957 called Verbal Behavior. And what he did was a conceptual analysis of expressive language. He wasn't so much interested at that time in the role of the, the listener, the, under, the, the receptive component of it, but rather taking a look at the variables that control the behavior of the speaker. And this is where it got interesting, because he said, language is behavior. If we look at it from that perspective, we can analyze it just like we'd analyze any other behavior. We can empirically measure it and study it. We can manipulate variables and see how it might respond to all those. And so what he did was took the tools of a behavior analyst. This is what we call the three-term contingency. And everybody, I think, is probably fairly familiar with it. If you've had any class in psychology whatsoever, you'll have seen something like this. Antecedent behavior consequences, called ABC analysis. You may have also seen it being stimulus response SR plus for reinforcing stimulus. There's all different variations of it, but basically it's the same thing. The notion is, 
is that behavior does not occur in isolation. Behavior occurs under certain types of situations. It's not occurring in a vacuum. It occurs in certain types of situational variables. And when that behavior occurs, certain consequences follow the behavior. And if those consequences uh, are favorable, if you will, for the individual, you'll find that there'll be an increase in the behavior occurring under similar circumstances in the future. And if those consequences are perhaps less desirable or unfavorable, that those will result in the behavior occurring less often in the future under similar circumstances. Basically, we're talking about there the concept of reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement being those consequences which result in the behavior occurring more often in the future under similar circumstances, and punishment or another concept called extinction being where the behavior occurs less in the future under similar circumstances. Basically, that's behavior analysis 101 in a nutshell, in about a minute, okay? But if you understand this concept, it's very, very powerful. Now, what I like to do for people is I like to do this. I reach in my pocket here and I find the biggest denomination I can, and I ask, is this a reinforcer? And I see people shaking their heads, yeah. And I said, okay, now we've got to go back to school because... You can't say whether or not any denomination of money is going to be a reinforcer at all until you see something happen. And that is you see this particular item follow a behavior and then you have to measure and see whether or not that behavior increased or not. Otherwise, it's not a reinforcer. And see, this is where we kind of mess up this concept all the time. Something so simple as the concept of reinforcement we find isn't really so simple after all, okay? A reinforcer is an event, it's a change in the environment that follows a behavior that makes that behavior more likely to occur again in the future under similar circumstances. If it hasn't changed the behavior, I don't care what it is, it's not a reinforcer. And this is where we get into trouble all the time when it comes to working with children with autism. People have their list and they say, here's the reinforcer list. Oh, I'm going to use this reinforcer. Oh, I'm praising him all the time. I'm reinforcing the behavior. But is praise a reinforcer or not? That's an entirely different issue. We, it may or it may not be. Would a $20 bill, would that be a reinforcer? Well, yeah, if I said to you, hey, would you give me five? And you give me five, and I give you a $20 bill, you're probably waiting for me to put my hand up again. You want that behavior to occur over and over again. You'd probably give me high fives as much as I would put my hand up. It would probably serve as a reinforcer for that. But if I said, hey, would you paint my house? And then you paint my house, and I say, oh, thank you very much, and I give you a $20 bill. Next time I say, hey, would you paint my house? Probably not. So this $20 bill could be a reinforcer for some behaviors, but not for other behaviors. It could be a, a reinforcer at some times and not at other times. Let's say you haven't eaten in the last three days. And there's a place over there that'll serve you some food, but you need some of these to get the food. I bet I can probably get a lot of behavior out of you to get the $20 bill to go get something to eat. However, if you just won the Powerball lottery and you've got these, you know, and you use these to wipe off your windshield, you know, in the morning and you throw them away, throw them to the wind because you've got so many of them, then you wouldn't probably do much for this at all, for this as a reinforcer. So in other words, the $20 bill can be a reinforcer under certain circumstances and not under other circumstances, even if the behavior so we were asking for were the same. Depends on how many of these you have, depends on what you have to do to get them, and so on. There's a lot of variables that affect the motivation of a child. So anyhow, basic behavior analysis. We have to use this tool. We have to understand the concepts of reinforcement very, very well. Okay. Anyhow, what Skinner did was he took this analysis and he applied it to expressive language. And this is where what he did was he said, expressive language is not just one behavior, but there's many behaviors. Now, I'm going to go over four of the important ones for you. There are others. But this is the basic verbal operants that we're going to be talking about here that are useful for working with children with autism. Basically, Skinner was saying, you could say book 
for many different reasons. And all of these are different behaviors. They're not the same. Even though the action, what you're hearing from the child is the same, they are actually functionally different behaviors. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you. I can say the word book or use sign language for the word book under the condition where I want a book. We call it a motivational operation. The child's motivated, if you will, to receive a book. So the child wants a book, he says book, and the reinforcement is he gets the book. Very, very powerful. Okay? But it's controlled by a motivational operation. It's controlled by the motivation to receive that item, if you will. Okay? That's one type. When we call this type of behavior the mand or the request is what we would say in English. Mand, there's a mnemonic for that, as in to command or demand, if you will, if you might want to think of it that way. But manding is basically requesting. And this is a very, very powerful type of expressive language for a child because if a child can ask for something and they get what they want, a number of important things happen. Number one, they see that language works for them. In other words, why should they talk? Well, if they can ask for something, they say book, and they get a book that they want, it's very, very powerful. Direct reinforcement, specific reinforcement. They get specifically what they're asking for. The other part that I think is very, very crucial from the social perspective is if they're asking me for a book, say book, and I give them the book, I'm now being paired with delivery of the reinforcing item my presence, my actions take on some conditioned reinforcement value. So I take on some value too, reinforcement value, as a function of this interaction. So this is one type of an expressive language response, the man. Again, it works for the child, okay? It works as they get what they want. Later on, they're going to learn they can't always get what they want, but that's a different and a better problem to have, okay? The child's acting out and you don't know why, and all of a sudden you teach them to ask for something and they're able to get it. At least now you know that they know you know what they want. And then when you don't give it to them and they're acting out, at least now you know the cost for their behavior. Whereas before you may not have known that in the past. So but the requesting repertoire is very, very important. Another type of expressive language response, which is an entirely different one, is what we call the tact or expressive labeling for something. And it's controlled by a situation where it's controlled by the item itself. We call that a nonverbal stimulus. We call it an item in everyday English, right? An item or action, something we see, hear, or smell, or touch, or feel, something that comes in contact with our senses. Tact. It's a label, expressive label. So I look out there and I see a book and I go, book. And the reinforcement for my saying book or signing book is that I usually get some social reinforcement, some non-specific reinforcement. I get some social reinforcement. You say, you're right, Jim, that is a book. Okay? So again, social reinforcement, it's not specific reinforcement. It's typically controlled by or reinforced with praise in our environment. Totally different. You can be able to ask for things, but yet not be able to label things. You could be able to label some things and not be able to ask for those same things when you need them. They're entirely separate skills, even though the action of the child saying book or sign book is identical. They're two functionally different behaviors, and they both need to be taught. Now, there's two other types that I want to go over with you today. One is what we call a coic or vocal imitation, and this is where the response book is controlled by a verbal stimulus. Somebody says book, and I say book, and so it's a verbal stimulus, I got a verbal response, and they match. Point to point correspond. Book, 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 book. They match, okay? They're identical. Book. We call that vocal imitation in English. We call it echoics in verbal behavior terminology. It's the same thing, okay? But you have to learn to be able to repeat what others are saying. And again, this is not resulting in specific reinforcement, this is resulting in social reinforcement typically that maintains that. Oh, you said that so well. Okay? So that's the third time. Just because I can say book doesn't mean I can ask for a book or I can label a book. Okay? Those are entirely separate skills. Three. Now I'm going to throw in one more. This one is very important for conversational type of speech. There isn't an English translation for this. It's called intraverbal. Basically, it's a verbal response controlled by a verbal stimulus that don't match. Okay. So you might say something you can read, something you find in a library, something you can put on your head to make you stand up straight. All might result in us being able to say book. 
Okay? Something that has pages, something that tells us a story. Okay? This is an example of the introverbal. And this is, again, talking about things, if you will, in their absence. It's not controlled by seeing a book. It's not controlled by wanting a book. It's not controlled by somebody's saying book. Again, it's an entirely separate skill. And what you'll find is that when you look at the training that often goes on for children with autism, what they're often doing is increasing their vocabulary by teaching them to be able to label a number of items, but not necessarily teaching them how to use it to be able to ask for things.